ever since the 1990s, uh, perhaps with, beginning with the Rodney King incident, perhaps in New York City we became more aware of it because of the incidents involving Abner Wawima and uh, Amadou Diallo and Patrick Durismund. The issue of racial profiling is on the table and has been, and it's gotten a lot of political attention from the Department of Justice in Washington and a lot of attention nationally in both in courts and in political circles, um, and has caused a great deal of concern and in part a breach between minority and white citizens with respect to their trust in the criminal justice system and their beliefs in the legitimacy of the law. The remedies that have been put into place are very aspirational. Um, it's not clear at all that they've been doing um, the work with respect to reducing racial disparities, and there's fairly strong evidence in Los Angeles, in New Jersey, in New York City, that even after um, stipulated settlements or consent decrees are put into place, profiling still exists. So the question is, how do we design consent decrees now uh, in light of what we learned over the past almost 20 years of federal um, action in this area, as well as a number of state cases, um, that would allow us to design an effective consent decree that would be something that would um, all parties would be able to buy into and um, embrace and, and move forward together. And that's a difficult question um, because the history of consent decrees suggests that they're not terribly effective. We've had consent decrees in New York. It's a stipulated settlement here. There have been consent decrees in New Jersey in a racial profiling case on uh, the, New, uh, the New Jersey Turnpike. Uh, there's a consent decree in Los Angeles in the aftermath of the Rampart scandal and other um, issues that arose in Los Angeles. And um, about 15 other places around the United States. So one way to think about consent decrees um, is to ask whether they're effective. Do they remedy or reduce the incidence of the problems that they were um, initially designed to address? Uh, do people regard policing in the city as a whole as being more legitimate because the uh, police are now more accountable in uh, conducting themselves and exercising their authority in a way that's more consistent with um, the values that the communities hold? Um, and just simply, um, do they wind up back in court? Are these places recidivist? Do they follow the orders of the consent decree or not? Um, by and large, the track record is not very good. In fact, it's quite poor. Um, so this raises the question about what good has come out? What elements of uh, a pretty poor performing set of consent decrees can we salvage? And what new ones ought to be in place? And this is an interesting and difficult question. The most important thing in, in, in um, fashioning a consent decree is designing the monitoring function and determining who is going to be the monitor and how that person is going to do their work. Um, monitors up until now have been selected from a fairly closed set of uh, social mm. networks. We basically, you see the same, it's not the mm. same people showing up over and over again. You see their organizations mm. generally being the ones who are selected to provide a monitor that will work both mm. for the court and for the municipality uh, to try and improve the workings of the police department. So for one, first of all, I think we need to think outside of the box quite a bit on who these monitors are and what, the, and, and what they're asked to do. They need to be more empowered with respect to using resources and commanding resources to bring them to bear on police departments. They need to have a broader set of skills. I think they're in place not just simply to decide is there a new training curriculum and is it a good one or not a good one, but they need to be able to think about what's going on inside the department, how is the department functioning, are the norms and values that were in place before that led to the troubles, are they still there? Um, does the, does the monitor have the right set of skills with respect to data analysis and looking at performance indicators, keeping being able to keep their pulse on the feel of the department, the rank and file, and also thinking about how the community is subjectively experiencing and evaluating policing. Beyond monitors, I think it's important to think about in benchmarking. One of the things that's remarkable in, in um, much of the, the what we've observed in consent decrees over the past several years is the failure of consent decree monitors to actually look and see whether or not there are still continue to be racial disparities, uh, illegal searches, uh, excessive use of force, um, and other problem indicate under other indicators of the problems that the consent decrees were designed to address. Uh, they really do look very late in the game rather than early on, and this is a problem. So I think we need to think very carefully about designing benchmarks asking questions that are relevant to the benchmarks as well as to the kinds of 
institutional redesign and architecture that we're trying to build within the police board. I think maybe the third issue that w that's relevant to um, making a consent decree functional and effective is taking the question of community involvement very seriously. In areas outside of policing, education, um, child welfare, uh, environmental reform and litigation and so on, um, having a large table with a group of diverse stakeholders seated around that table with open access to information, information that's been transparently, that, that, that information that suggests a transparency on the part of the police department, being able to ask questions of that data and directly address and have conversations with people who are uh, the relevant stakeholders in the consent decree. All of these are important processes to breathe new perspectives and new thoughts and new ideas and even perhaps new practices um, into the process. And also it's an opportunity for police to communicate a little bit more effectively to the populations that they, are, that they in fact are policing. Policing is a public good. We want it to be produced as a public good, and we want the citizens of the city who are police uh, to decide that that public good is actually something they value and that respects them and treats them with dignity.